bad. Holy sh! Here to talk about what I believe is without a doubt one of the most underrated Batman movies of all time. I think this one flew under the radar for most, no bat pun intended, and those who did see it were just kind of meh about the whole ordeal. But trust me, this is it. Batman Gotham by Gaslight is an adaptation of the book of the very same name, but I'm using that term very loosely here as this story is very loosely adapted from that comic book. As a matter of fact, when all is said and done, these two stories have much more to contrast than they do to compare. They're much more different than they are alike. Basically, all the movie and the book have in common outside of a title are the time period it takes place in and the character's design. But otherwise, they're two entirely different experiences. I do intend on covering the comic book here on the channel, so if that's something you might be interested, let me know in the comment section by leaving a comment saying, Got them by gaslighting. Like I said, they're not all going to be intelligent or particularly well thought out, but these weird code words, they help me out a lot. You guys help guide me down the right path on this channel. Think of yourselves as the gaslight to my lantern. Boo this man! Let me be real with you, I usually save this for the end, but I love this movie. Firstly, I'm a sucker for Elseworld stories. Especially when those stories have a good story to tell, or interesting ways of reinventing characters. And this movie is chock full of that. I think they have some really interesting uses and reimaginings for certain Batman characters. Having the original three Robins team together as a street gang of orphans. Showcasing Poison Ivy as a burlesque dancer with the leaf gimmick. Having Catwoman as a nightclub performer and a sort of advocate of women. And Hugo Strange is... No, well, Hugo Strange just kind of stays the same, but, but he's wearing a hat now, so there is that. And having Leslie Tompkins serve the role as a nun as opposed to a doctor seems fitting for this time period, as I'd imagine there weren't too many female doctors. They're all great. Sure, most of these characters don't play major roles, but they do find a place in the story and their presence is never too distracting. It'd be far too easy to make them all unnecessary cameos. But most of them serve some sort of purpose even if it's not that much of one. I like how in order to properly fit in with the times, a whole bunch of characters are intentionally worsened. Like, this is the sleaziest interpretation of Harvey Dent ever put to film. Bruce, I'm in love. Well, that's great news, Harvey. I'm sure your wife will be glad to hear it. They make mention of him acting like two different people, but if that's the case, then both of them suck. And Harvey Bullock... Well, no, Harvey Bullock pretty much stays the same. Except now we have the added benefit of seeing him with a handlebar mustache and mutton chops. Seeing these variations of these characters does a whole lot to allow us to better understand this version of Gotham City. And it also emphasizes that despite the change of scenery, this still is in fact Gotham City. The characters feel like the characters we've grown up watching and reading. Just time error appropriate. Except for one or two characters who have gone through some immense changes, but, but I think they're warranted in their own unique way. We'll get to that later. It walks the line of being completely different, but all too similar. Now, it's not all great. This movie does have its faults. I will admit the animation does look like it's a little bit cheap. Some corners have definitely been cut, and they found a way to work around a budget. But I still think that they did a serviceable job, and it's... alright. It's not the best, but it's not like it's awful. It's just okay. But I think this movie makes up for whatever blemishes it has. The money may not have gone into making this look like a great Batman movie, but at least it went into securing the right people to make this a great Batman movie. You have a top-notch voice cast. You got Dexter's sister as Selina Kyle, and she is perfect. Now, I wrote down to purr on perfect, but at last minute, I realized that I was neither a cat nor a woman. It didn't feel right in any context. Giles from Buffy is playing Alfred, which is just as great as it sounds. Spider-Man is Harvey Dent. The dude from Gilmore Girls plays Commissioner Gordon. At least I think he's from Gilmore Girls. I've never seen the show, but I saw commercials, so... I'm gonna assume that that's him. I might be wrong. We'll check and post. They even brought in Grey DeLisi and Tara Strong to voice other characters. Not to mention that Bruce Greenwood is back as Batman. Let me tell you, you cannot go wrong with having Bruce voice Bruce. It just, it's too great. 
Dude always does his part and does it well. I didn't include him in my initial top five Batman. If I got the chance to redo it all again, I definitely would. That was a huge mistake on my part. It's hard to single out one good performance with this cast of people because everybody is so on point for this. I think if I had to just pick one or two, it'd probably be Batman and Catwoman. I was genuinely surprised to learn that Jennifer Carpenter was the woman behind Catwoman. It's not the kind of performance I would expect out of her based on some of her previous work, but man, she really nails the role, and I would not mind seeing her return to the character in some form or another. Honestly, I'm a little bit bummed with how little Alfred gets to do when he's given the perfect voice actor. I'm hoping we get to see Anthony Stewart Head get another chance to perform as Alfred. And I'm hoping he gets another chance, not because he messed up the first chance, but because this movie messed up by not giving him more attention. This whole movie has a really interesting concept. Having Batman take on the infamous Jack the Ripper. It's not something I would have ever thought of, but then again, neither is Pirate Batman or Joker Batman. Vampire Batman, maybe, but that, that's an easy one. He's a bad person, they're bad people, it just makes too much sense. Jack the Ripper mostly targets women of a certain work environment. Let's call them... sax workers. He specifically goes after sax workers because societally it's quietly accepted. And when I say quietly, I mean shouting at a full volume. Women are being gutted in the streets like wild game, and the Gotham police stand twiddling their thumbs. No ladies have been killed, Miss Kyle. Some gin-soaked women of the street have met their fate, as is common to their kind. These women are seen as lesser than, and because of that, there isn't that big of an investigation or a call to end the Ripper. It would even seem that there are some who support his heinous action. On the police squad. The movie makes it seem like there's only three interested parties in helping these ladies out. Them being none other than our dear Dark Knight, Catwoman minus the cat, and of course, good old Commissioner Gordon. Man, that guy is great and everything. He just... What a good man. Now, normally, Selina Kyle is a character who I think for the most part is out for herself, and always looking out for her own best interest, despite also having a surprisingly soft spot for Batman. But I think placing her in this time period and this environment with these specific circumstances where women are being looked down upon like second-class citizens would have a profoundly different effect on the character. Growing up in a certain environment is going to have an effect on your personality and your mentality. When you get down to it, we are who we're allowed to be. So I think she comes off as true to her nature, but given the fact that women at this time are thought so little of, I think her need to look out for herself would become a need to look out for those in her situation. Am I reaching a little bit here? Maybe. But that's my headcanon, and it makes sense to me. So, bite me. The movie does a very good job at creating and building up the mystery of Jack the Ripper. There are several red herrings, with the most prominent being Harvey Dent, who I think played the perfect scapegoat for this plot. Everybody knows that Harvey Dent is Two-Face. A man who, even prior to his scarring, was of two minds. Harvey suffers from dual identities, and there's several references made throughout of Harvey acting different in different situations. On top of that, Harvey's also seen with the top hat, much similar to Jack the Ripper, on a couple of occasions. The plot twist that Jack the Ripper is none other than Jim Gordon himself was an absolute shock to me and my buddy Ray as the first time we watched this movie. And I kind of love it for that. It's not very often that movies surprise me. As someone who constantly ruins movies for his closest friends and family by correctly guessing the ending or plot twist while we're watching the movie, by the way, you can imagine I usually go to the movie theater alone, this is one ending I did not guess. I came nowhere near close to connecting these dots. And I think a big part of the reason is because I felt at ease with these characters. I knew Jim Gordon. It couldn't have been Jim. The fact that it could have been Jim never even crossed my mind. Jim wouldn't do this. This is not his nature. But he did. And I love it for that. The movie was clearly leading us to think that Jack the Ripper was Harvey Dent. There was a scene or two where I thought it might have been too obvious. But hey, maybe this movie is less about the mystery and more about the story in full. I was really banking on Jack the Ripper being Harvey's separate identity. But instead, this movie took a risk, and I think it kind of paid off. Now, some of you may say that this is complete destruction of everything we know about Jim Gordon. An honest man who is trying to do good in a corrupt system. 
the heart of the GCPD, always doing what's right, even if it's not right for him. How could they write him out to be some sort of woman-hating lunatic? Well, first and foremost, let us remember that this is in fact an Elseworld story, meaning that these characters aren't the characters we're used to. They're completely different reimaginings of these characters. And secondly, I'd like to point out that this appears to be some sort of amalgamation of both Jim Gordon Sr. and Jim Gordon Jr. Jim Gordon Sr. in name and status, and Jim Gordon Jr. in being a bloodlusting psychopath. The plot twist is one of those twists that make me appreciate the rest of the movie more. I like that it managed to hide this reveal in plain sight. When re-watching certain scenes, it's clear as day. Jim is haunted by nightmares of the Ripper taking the life of his wife. And as a first time viewer, and someone who's familiar with these characters, I would think that this is just due to the love of his family and fear of what could happen, mixed with the excess time that he spent working on the case. But following the twist re-watching this, you realize it's actually his fear of his own murderous wrath meeting his wife, and having her meet a terrible fate. Or in that same exact scene when Jim is in private with his wife, talking about how he must rid the streets of evil and stop Gotham from, in his own words, going to hell. You would think that he's talking about stopping the Ripper, but in actuality, he's talking about cleansing Gotham of the ladies of the night. He feels he's just in his actions by eradicating women of ill repute. I like a lot of the subtle little references they make in passing here. There's not a whole lot of attention put on them, but they're said and done with intention. Like, if you don't know, it's not going to take anything away from the story for you, but if you know, you know. What are you, scared of the dark, little Tim? Nah, it's just... After what happened to Johnny Gobbs, I... That ain't real, Timmy. What, are you scared of heights? After what happened to Johnny Gobbs? Hey, look, man, Johnny Gobbs got ripped and took a walk off a roof, all right? No big loss. I heard the bat got him. The bat? Oh, man. Who will face Cyrus Gold? Big Bill Dust territory. Interfering with my amiable cock robins. There's plenty more than just Easter eggs here, though. A lot is conveyed about these characters in this world through simple actions. Alfred outwitting a street gang and holding his own well could be an indication of the character's known past with the CIA, or whatever would be the time-appropriate equivalent here. In the movie, they refer to Gotham's Ferris wheel as the Fox Wheel. Now, the Ferris wheel is named that way because the dude who made it was named... something Ferris. Which means in this case, the unseen Lucius Fox is the creator of such. Selina Kyle never dons the cat suit in this, but many mentions of cats are made in reference to her, including eventually her giving her backstory of originally being a lion tamer at the zoo. Listen carefully, kitten. I'm many things, but I'm nobody's pet. Hugo Strange deduces Batman's secret identity, much like he does in the comics and video games. Although there are some things that I openly wonder if they are actual references or maybe I'm just looking into them too much. Like, this one always bothered me. Are we supposed to take the old drunkard as this world's Harley Quinn? Because her name is Marlene, which is awfully close to Harleen, which is the original name of Harley Quinn. She acts like an absolute nut, much like Harley Quinn, and she's also voiced by Tara Strong, much like Harley Quinn. Also, Jim Gordon damages one side of his wife's face and his brutality sends her into a psychosis. So, like... Is that just something that happens, or is that this version of events is Two-Face? Thoughts in the comment section, I actually want to hear them. I think the action in this movie is really, really good. Yes, everything is done on a budget, but I think that they made that budget work. The sequence of events makes every fight scene must-see. This movie demands your utmost attention in these moments. So much as blinking means you're missing the movie's next epic moment. Now, there's two major fight scenes between Batman and the Ripper, one of which takes place on a blimp about to explode, crashing into buildings and ruining the city, and the final battle between good and evil includes hand-to-hand -hand combat amidst a Ferris wheel on fire. That is an accurate description of what happens in this movie, and it is every bit as crazy as it sounds. Maybe even more so. Now, as an adaptation, I would say this movie is rather unfaithful. Much like these women, am I right, James? No, seriously, like, it is really unfaithful to the actual comic. Not only is the Ripper not Jim Gordon in that, 
but the original story didn't even include or mention Catwoman, who is pretty integral to the plot here. She didn't even exist in that telling of the tale. So as an adaptation that faithfully matches its source material, no, this is, this is not great. But on its own merit, I enjoyed this quite a bit. I like its reimagining of these characters. I like that this time period provides a fresh atmosphere for them. And I like that it's something old, but something new at the same time. Not only did it have an interesting environment to tell its story in, it had an interesting story to tell in that environment. It's definitely a more simple telling of the tale than the comic is, but I find that sometimes when you simplify a story, it makes it easier to perfect. Batman Gotham by Gaslight is one of my all-time favorite Batman movies. I would absolutely say this movie is must-see. So if you haven't given it a chance yet, I highly advise you to check it out. What do you have that your comrades don't? A cape. Now I bought this movie back on day one, but we're now on year two of me having this, and I still haven't seen it. Much like Gotham by Gaslight, this movie is another Elseworlds Batman tale. This time taking place in the 1970s, taking very obvious inspiration from kung fu flicks, and James Bond movies. A fact that is made very evident before the opening credit sequence even begins. And you are? Dragon. Richard Dragon. Now just by hearing all of this, I think you can probably already tell that this is a very, very different type of Batman story. But the truth of the matter is, this is barely a Batman story at all. I think my biggest issue with the movie is that it's a Batman movie in name only. Bruce isn't even introduced or brought into this movie until we've already had a few scenes with our main protagonist, who is not Batman, and our main antagonist, who is also not Batman. I don't know why he would be. A whole 10 minutes of runtime is devoted to Richard Dragon and his dude who kind of resembles a cobra making Bruce feel like a little bit of an afterthought when he finally shows up. And then that fact is cemented by the rest of the movie. Even in the opening credits, he's taking a backseat to the other characters. In a weird way, Batman feels like an unneeded addition in what is allegedly his own movie. I really think that you could just take Batman out of the equation altogether, and it really wouldn't affect all that much. Like, if you replaced Batman in this with any other DC character, or hell, an original made-up character for this movie, it doesn't change anything. By the end of the movie, it really feels like the only reason Batman was added into the mix at all is so they can include him on the cover and in the trailers. Let's face it, if you name something Batman, it's much more likely to sell. Case in point, me buying this movie the day it came out, despite having no immediate intention of watching it. To take it a step further, Bruce is only in the suit for less than a handful of scenes. Like, we're talking about three, maybe four tops. Batman being involved in this plot is such a non-factor. He's a side character who could have easily been replaced by just about anybody. No one else is in a costume in this movie until, like, one scene at the end, and it's only one other person. So he stands out and feels completely out of place in what is, once again, supposed to be his own movie. He doesn't feel important or specific to the plot. He doesn't feel like he has his own story arc. He doesn't even really get any time to shine during the runtime of the film. This is not a Batman movie. This is a Richard Dragon movie disguised and purposed as a Batman movie. Like, honestly, I could probably do the rest of this review without ever mentioning the Caped Crusader again. That's how inconsequential he is in his own movie. He's not the main character, he's not what the story is about. Hell, he's not even the one who saves the day at the end of the movie. I'm gonna be honest with you, this movie really wasn't catching my attention at first. As someone who's never been too deep into the James Bond series or Bruce Lee movies or the 1970s in general, I guess, it just wasn't doing it for me. Then you add on top of that the lack of Batman in what is being promoted as a Batman movie. I just wasn't a fan of this. But this one scene, this one speech, is where things started to turn around for me. Because I'm such a fan of what this scene represents. Evil is as eternal as this rock. Even if you break the rock, there will be pebbles. Break the pebbles, there will be sand. 
Even after being told that erasing evil is a meaningless effort, even after being told that the rock will never truly fully break, Bruce doesn't give up. He persists bloodying his knuckles. Knowing that he is looking at an impossible task, it doesn't stop him. He keeps going. He keeps trying. He still does all that he can. And to me, this is Batman. Batman is never giving up even when the odds are against you. Even when there is no possible chance of winning, to rise to that challenge one way or another regardless. Batman doesn't fight evil because he knows it's a fight that he'll win. He fights evil because he opposes it. It's not about victory, it's about doing what's right. And doing what's right at any cost. That is Batman. Outside of this, I really like a lot of what is done aesthetically. And I especially like that this Batman more closely resembles Batman in his first ever comic book appearance. That's a nice little touch there. It's cute. I, I like it. I like this movie's use of DC characters who are less mainstream. It definitely puts a spotlight on the less read pages of DC Comics Encyclopedia. I know I had to look up a name or two myself during. And I even like that it has some actors returning to the roles they played in separate continuities. Michael J. White returns to the role of Bronze Tiger a role that he played back on Arrow. And Kelly Hu returns to the role that she played in Arkham Origins, that of course being Lady Shiva. I like the structure of the story, going between past and present to play out its plot properly. I'm a fan of this type of storytelling when it's done right. And here, it is definitely done right. This movie balances its timeline well, never devoting too much time to what's already happened or what's currently happening. It also very clearly differentiates its two time periods as well, so it's all very digestible and understandable. It's not like you have to sit down and start taking notes. This isn't Memento. Another trope this plays on is getting the band back together, and that's a trope that I really like. So the fact that it's basically the focal point of this flick... I like it. It takes place in its own world, in its own universe, and it's doing its own thing entirely. If you wanted to see Batman get trained by the League of Assassins, well... You're kind of shit out of luck. Because here, Bruce Wayne was trained by O-Sensei, along with a whole class of other characters, including the well-trained and dedicated deadly ninja and assassin Lady Shiva, the furious fighter Bronze Tiger, the agile agent with attitude Jade, Rip the war hero, and O-Sensei's protege, Richard Dragon. Or as I like to call him, Richie the Dragon Steamboat. They train in a monastery where there's a secret passage referred to only as the gate. It's a forbidden door that is the physical embodiment of the phrase, don't ask, don't tell. The mystical doorway is shrouded in mystery, and also mysticism, but I, but I already said that. Osensei grants his top student Shiva the Soulbreaker Sword, an item that he entrusts to her, even if he doesn't necessarily trust her enough to reveal its intended purpose. I enjoy the scenes watching this team interact and slowly become a family. Watching them fight through their differences and learning to respect each other in spite of them, watching them bond and become a unit, it's all great, but I just wish there was a little bit more of it. Regardless, I think this movie did a really good job of explaining its characters and establishing their relationships in just an hour and 22 minutes. For a bunch of characters I didn't know prior to pressing play, I now feel like I have a better understanding of. Their motivations, their goals, their personalities, and that's no easy task. Especially when considering that's a very limited time to endear an audience to a bunch of C, D, and Z list characters. Rip eventually betrays the team, stealing the Soul Breaker and killing Jade in the process, all while trying to open the portal. With the use of Soul Breaker, Jade is sacrificed, and the gate opens to reveal. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? The snake-like demons kill Rip, so... Rip Rip? The team fights off these snake-like demons in a hellish battle, with O-Sensei ultimately sacrificing himself to properly close the portal. Back in present day, a snake cult named Cobra... No, not that one. This one's with a K. Cobra is looking to open up the gateway once more. Because yeah, of course they are. Their name is Cobra. They have a bunch of lame snake-like characters in their cult, which I'm also gonna spell with a K here as well. But this gang is just filled with a bunch of lame asses who have an affinity for serpents. Snag. I'm a snag. I'm a snag. I'm a snag. You have its leader who I think is just called Cobra, once again, with a K. You got a guy whose limb turns into snakes. 
He has some German name that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce because I'll say it and then I'm not only saying it wrong, but I'm probably saying something offensive. Then again, almost anything in German sounds offensive for some reason. So I'm just going to call him the Human Hydra. You have King Snake, who, who thought that tattoo was a good idea. And then you have Lady Eve, who is... She's the useless chick! Oh! Yeah! So that's the whole class of Slytherin this school year. I like the way this movie depicts its characters. And it kind of gives everyone their own defining moment. The movie tells us a lot about its leads without necessarily always coming right out and saying it. Like the way Richard Dragon uses his intelligence to defeat King Snake by obscuring his hearing and playing mind games with him. Or the way that Shiva loses her sword in battle, but doesn't lose her cool. Fool. You gave up your weapon. I am the weapon. And the way Bronze Tiger shows a moment of true humanity, finding himself unable to murder Cobra as a child, despite knowing that he is destined to do awful things. All of these characters are flawed, but likable. And despite their contrasting personalities and interests, when aligned together, they make for a pretty great team. Side note here, there does seem to be some Mortal Kombat shoutouts, like these guys over here who look like a cross between Raiden and Sub-Zero. Of course, this could be a reference to something culturally that I'm completely unaware of. And if that's the case, and you know and I don't, I love to learn. Let me know in the comment section below. But yeah, the first time I saw this, all I can think of was... <laughs> And it didn't help matters that later in the movie, Shiva goes one-on-one -on -one with fucking Kano over here. Fine. Have it your way. Overall, I think this is actually a pretty good movie. But it in no way, shape, or form is a good Batman movie. Or even a Batman movie at all. I like this movie a whole lot. I think it's good. I think it's even great. It is absolutely something I would, and probably will, watch again for entertainment purposes alone. I'm not even trying, I'm not even trying to make money off it, I'm gonna watch it, that's how much I like it. But this is not a Batman movie. This is a movie that has Batman in it. And even, and even then so, just, just barely. I enjoyed watching this so much that quite frankly, I'm a little bit bummed out that there's no follow-up. All I'm saying is I wouldn't mind visiting this Elseworld again. And the way this movie ended, the, the way that they closed it off, it leaves it wide open for a sequel. Not only does it set up the possibility of a sequel, as a matter of fact, I, I think a sequel is a necessity at this point. It needs one. It needs to happen. Bruce Tim, if you're listening, as you so often do to this channel, don't do me like that, man. I, I just, I, I need to know what happens next. You didn't even end this movie. You, you just started a new one and, and then went to credits. If you're looking to just sit down and be entertained, I would highly recommend this movie. If you're a diehard Batman fan, then yeah, I would also recommend this movie. But I want you to know what you're getting into. This movie isn't awesome because Batman's in it. It's awesome and Batman just so happens to be in it. A little bit. I am Batman. In the past, I've claimed that I've watched both the weirdest Batman movie and the darkest Batman movie. But now, I don't know if either of those two claims are true. Because today, I'm here to talk to you about what might actually be the weirdest and darkest Batman movie ever made. The latest animated feature, Batman, The Doom That Came to Gotham. A movie that pits Batman against Cthulhu and other Lovecraftian entities. There's eyeless minions, mutant penguins, and a mutant penguin. And that's just within the first few minutes of the movie. So, you know, this is just fun for the whole family. Now, when this was first announced, I initially thought this might be a sequel to Gotham by Gaslight. It's kinda in the same time period, and the Batman suit is identical. It's very reminiscent to the suit worn in that Elseworld tale. But at last, this is an Elseworld Elseworld. It just so happens that this is kinda the universal Batman costume of the past. What I've always loved about Elseworld stories is the alternate versions of characters that they bring. How these classic characters are adjusted to better fit in with the world around them. And the doom that came to Gotham is sure to supply some strange alternate versions of beloved characters. So get ready because this alternate reality is ready to take your perception of characters and events and throw it on its head. You would think that changing the setting and time period would only change the characters to make them more era appropriate. And while this story does do that with some, with others they kind of take the characters and dynamics you know and do whatever they want with them. 
that's not so much a complaint as it is an acknowledgement of what they're doing. I mean, ideally, I think I would like to see characters who are reminiscent of the characters I know, just with, you know, alternate skins or means behind them. But some of these reimaginings are so different that they almost feel like an entirely separate creation. Mr. Freeze is often depicted as being Batman's most sympathetic villain. His origin story is so tragic, he's almost Shakespearean. He's trapped in an ice suit, struggling to survive. And yet he only cares about his survival because it ensures his wife's. Whereas here, Mr. Freeze goes by the name Grendon and is a frozen zombie minion to the forces of evil. You see what I'm saying? It, it's a completely different thing that is only vaguely similar to something else that we know. This Mr. Freeze has sacrificed his eyes to the doom that will come to Gotham. It feels like Grendon serves the Renfield role. He's the bizarre slave of the Big Bad, which is definitely quite different from the Mr. Freeze that we're all familiar with. The character's also played by David Dasmalchin, who has become a bit of a DC legend in the last decade or so, starring in everything from The Dark Knight to Gotham, and a bunch of shows and movies in between, and then also again after. The Penguin is a captain that went out to sea and never came back. He's slowly morphing and evolving into a hideous monster, while accompanied by his monstrous penguins. Again, not quite what you'd expect of this character, but uh, yeah, I guess it fits. I guess if I'm trying to explain what this character is uh, in layman's terms, he started off as Burgess Meredith, but he's slowly transforming into Danny DeVito as time goes on. Then you have the man who would be Man Bat a crazed scientist who claims he speaks to bats, and that those bats warn him of the impending titular doom that's coming to Gotham. Though there might be something to that, as Bruce Wayne is also getting premonitions as well. And we all know how well it went last time Bruce Wayne got a premonition. You have some characters like Killer Croc who mostly stay the same, except whereas before he was mostly mindless, here he is entirely mindless. Like Mr. Freeze, he's a mere minion. A Lovecraftian monster conjured up by the Al Ghouls. Not unlike this story's Poison Ivy, who is a humanoid that Talia and Rage created to get one over on Harvey Dent. While Poison Ivy has very limited screen time, she leaves her mark on the runtime by leaving her mark on the brand new mayor, Harvey Dent. Her touch infecting and scarring him, turning him into this version of events Two-Face. Harvey's story, while as always is tragic, is given so little attention here, and he himself means so little to the plot at hand, both before and after his scarring, it almost makes you wonder why they even bothered. Now, I need to bring this up. I'm aware that this movie is actually based on a three-issue comic series. It's one that I'm not very familiar with, but I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that that series probably better utilized both Harvey Dent and the Penguin, because here in this movie, they're kind of there, and they're being affected by the world around them, but they're not really playing any specific purpose. So I imagine that they probably had a greater role, or at least did something more impactful to the plot in the comic. But here in the movie, they're just kind of chilling. They're sort of there. I'm really happy to see Etrigan the Demon, mainly because I really like the character. Etrigan has always been one of my favorite underutilized characters in DC, so I'm glad to see him make an appearance here. And I'm glad to see him play a part in the story. His characterization is pretty spot on, as there's not a lot of changes to speak of. If there is anything that's changed, it's just giving him clothes that fit in with the setting. While some of the changes and alterations made to Gotham may seem a little bit random, there are also a few that make perfect sense. Ra's al Ghul and Talia feel mostly the same, just now they're more tailored to this particular story. The characters have always been veiled in mysticism and dark magic to begin with, so they're sort of right at home in this type of tale. Replacing the League of Assassins is the Cult of Ghoul, though they've allegedly been dead for centuries. Raish is depicted as an ancient dark priest who used necromancy to lead an army, which to be fair, isn't entirely unlike him. You know, he wielded the power of the Lazarus Pit, which healed wounds and had the ability to bring people back from the dead. This is basically the same thing, just with less steps. However, a significant difference here comes from his place in the story. While Raish is still almost all-powerful, he technically isn't the big bad. In actuality, this Raish al Ghul is surprisingly a servant. A servant looking to become a mere vessel for the real master, Cthulhu. There's not as much to say for Talia as there is for her father. The part is well performed, as they brought back the same voice actress from the Gotham Knights video game to play her, but ultimately she's mostly just the muscle. 
here to distract Batman with her combat as her father acts out his most nefarious plans. She plays the part well, and her part in the story makes sense, but I'm finding it really hard to say anything about her. I, I think that little summary I gave you, that sums it up. That's all there is. I mean, she does have a little fun line acknowledging her connection to Batman in other media. I'd rather like to think that under different circumstances, we'd be allies. Friends, perhaps. Doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense here, as they've never had a bonding experience of any kind and have done nothing but fight. I mean, they've shared more fists than they have words at this point in time, but, you know, I guess as a nice little wink and nod to the folks at home, that's, that's cool. But I can't really say much for her. She serves no purpose past being an occasional obstacle. She means so very little to not only the story, but the characters in said story, that after she falls to her death, her father looks at a murderer like he's mildly annoyed. This man is just looking at him thinking, Hey, I only have one more of those now. But Batman's rogues gallery aren't the only ones who have been altered for this telling of the tale. Most of the Batman family have been considerably changed. I mean, Alfred is mostly the same, potentially because he's being portrayed by Brian George, who has had some history with the character before. But this new Bat family consists of not capes and cowls, but instead just a close team of people that help Bruce in his day-to-day -day behind the scenes cave work. I actually like this for this version of events for the fact that because there's less technology available, I think it makes sense that Batman would need to have more hands on deck. His day-to-day -day team consists of the usual likes of Alfred, Lucius Fox, Dick Grayson, and then you have Kylie and Sanjay. Kylie Kane is obviously this story's version of Cassandra Kane, though I will say unlike the other Bat family members mentioned, this character has a lot less to do with her predecessor. Her predecessor who is a mute assassin trained since birth by the League of Assassins. I think Kylie isn't a fantastic reinterpretation or representation of Cassandra, but judging the character on her own merit, I was somewhat a fan. Considering that Sanjay usually goes by Jay, and that his last name is Todd, I think it's more than likely this is a stand-in for Jason Todd. And this character is absolutely nothing like Jason Todd. Trust me, I would know. He comes off as a very generic placement holder which is probably why he's the first one to go. But the most out there depiction of a well-established character has to be this Earth's Oracle. While she's still Barbara Gordon, she's definitely not any version of Barbara Gordon that we're used to. And by extension, is certainly not any version of the Oracle that we're used to either. This Barbara isn't incredibly intelligent or gifted with technology, she is instead significantly more mystical. Following an unspecified accident, Barbara is yet again a wheelchair user. Though unlike the Barbara we're familiar with, this Barbara has taken up vacancy at Arkham Asylum, being seen as crazy because she openly claims that she can channel spirits. Substantially less affected by this Elseworld, is Jim Gordon. Not a lot has really changed about the character, there's just some minor tampering to make him better fit in with this time period, but the performance itself really stands out, as none other than John DiMaggio is in the role. I would have never thought about this actor for the part, but it works really well and I wouldn't mind seeing him return to the role in the future. But out of everyone though, I think that Green Arrow is probably the most interesting. Like all around, he's just the best. He has the most compelling story arc out of all the characters, he has the greatest characterization out of all the characters, he has the strongest personality out of all the characters. This is everything you'd hope to get out of Green Arrow performance, but with a twist. Despite initially being presented as an outrageous drunken goofball, it's eventually revealed that he's much more three-dimensional than his 2D appearance would let on. It may seem like this Oliver Queen is always chasing a party, but in actuality he's running from his demons, desperately trying to escape a past that wasn't even his. This is an arrow riddled with guilt, believing that he now carries the burdens of the sins of his father. His father, who as it turns out, murdered the Waynes in Crime Alley, and might actually be this version of the Ben stand-in for the Joker? Oliver is tormented knowing that his father ended his best friend's father's life. He tries his best to be a buddy to Bruce, while also secretly trying to ensure that what happened to him will never happen to anyone again. In effort to seek redemption for his father's sins, to wash away the evil that his father's actions have left on his family's legacy, Oliver becomes a selfless crusader. That's definitely not what I expected when they introduced us to this mess of a man, as he happily drunkenly boasts about old Bruce stories.
is. I think that tragic and traumatic backstory does a lot to humanize Ollie, and it really pulls the character together. He starts this movie off as a punchline, but he ends it landing punches. Now, if none of that is blowing your mind yet, have I mentioned that Bruce's father, Thomas Wayne, Ollie's father, Henry Queen, Man Bat Dad, Bartley Langstrom, and the Penguin himself, Oswald Cobblepot, are all hundreds of years old? Having been gifted eternal life and seen incredible success, they've all been gifted eternal life after performing a ritual out of the Necronomicon. Unfortunately, their selfishness slowly summon the creature forward and destroy their lives in the process, driving Penguin to the brink of insanity as he slowly loses himself and mutates, leading Kirk Langstrom's father to take his own life, leading Ollie's father to take Bruce's father's life. A vision of Bruce's father Thomas warns his son that the sins of the father will fall upon the son, as the children of those who summon the creature are being punished for their father's crimes. And Batman, understandably, is the only one who could stop it. One addition to the mythos here that I'm a pretty big fan of is the emphasis that's put on bats. Creatures of the night are shown to be vital to this story. They're not just some namesake Bruce took up after he fled from a swarm of them. They've essentially chosen Bruce, and it's only through the bats that Bruce can be guided to salvation. Whatever that means. I know I said it before, but it bears repeating. This stuff is kind of why I love Elseworlds. Because it really does just throw your knowledge of this universe out the window in favor of doing its own original thing with the classic. You kind of have to go into these events with no expectations. Because you really can't use previous knowledge of these characters to determine what's going to happen next or what they will or won't do. Because ultimately, despite their names, these characters aren't those characters. At least not in full. Although what's really funny is that in spite of all that's changed, Batman has still mostly remained the same. The setting, the time period, the rest of the characters, the world surrounding him, all completely changed. And yet Batman, totally indifferent to the passage of time. You wanna know why that is? It's cause he's timeless. Classics are always in stock. I mean, this Bruce Wayne is depicted as being an explorer, but outside of that, that's pretty much it. He's still the same Batman. And I mean that in more ways than one, as returning to the role of Batman is none other than David Chitoli, who played the part before back in Batman Soul of the Dragon, which happened to be another Elseworld Batman tale. I really like the way the movie goes about showing off Batman, as we see him constantly putting his thirst for justice above everything else, ignoring health issues and other concerns about his safety, all to further his research, choosing to examine the substance on his suit as he's bleeding out, rather than seek medical help. I love that. I also love that this Bruce seems like he's always on the verge of snapping. Now granted, it's actually because there's the spirit of bats that's speaking to him at all times. But still, I think these unpredictable and unhinged actions, whether intentional or not, highlight the character's fractured psyche. The movie really puts Batman through the ringer. Not only does he have to deal with an incredible amount of heartbreak as he sees several loved ones meet their demise during the runtime. But the movie has the gall to resurrect his loved ones to tear away at these still fresh wounds. Batman fights off the demented spirits of his best friend and wards, fighting the only family he's known in an effort to save their souls. To say the very least, that's rough. And after Batman completes the mission, Ollie in his last breath even thanks him in the most Oliver Queen way I can think of. Ah! Thank God. Kick their ass, boss. Look, I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I have not been honest with you guys. Remember way back when, when I mentioned that everything changes, but Batman stays the same? Well, that's mostly true. At the end of the movie, there's, um, there's a change that's made, for sure. At the end of the movie, Batman accepts his death and lets Bruce Wayne die so that he can become the symbol that is Batman. Uh, by which I mean he literally becomes a giant bat monster in order to stop Cthulhu. Ah, yes. That's the way I was hoping my Batman movie would end. The kaiju fight. That's, uh, yep. That's what I signed up for. This bat spirit kind of looks like what would happen if they redesigned a man bat to be a character on the show Gargoyles. And uh, this isn't a temporary thing either. This isn't like how Spider-Man turned into a Spider-Man. Batman is literally now a Batman. And that's that. You just need to accept that and move on. As a matter of fact, the movie ends with Batman briefly beating Rage in a monster battle, only for Etrigan the Demon to show up and sacrifice himself to completely take the W away from Batman in spite of his new makeover, 
and then Gotham City goes up in flames. That's the end. That is that is not a joke that I am making. That is the canon end of this movie. This is undoubtedly one of the most bizarre Batman stories to ever transition from comic to film. It is so strange and uniquely its own that I can't help but love it for what it is. If I'm being real here, I don't feel like they went all out with the premise. I feel like there was a little bit more in that juice box that they could have they could have gone to, but they, they didn't quite take it to the heights that I thought they were going to. Nonetheless, I still think it's really good. I really, really like the action scenes. While watching this movie, I was constantly noting how great the visuals were. And in my head, I was like, oh, I'm going to use this for the video. I'm going to use that. I, I can't wait to show my audience this. So visually, it's stunning. I really like the way this movie showcases Batman visually. I think that they really capture the character in a way that a lot of Batman movies simply don't. And a lot of scenes with the character look like they're trailer shots from an actual cinematic movie. So, plenty to love here. And I must say, I really like this Batman design. I know it's been used elsewhere in Elseworlds, but honestly, it's pretty solid and I've never not loved it. I want to give a quick shout out to Ola's era-appropriate gadgets as well. I thought those were a really nice touch. I think some of the characters made sense as this world's alternate take on those characters, while others felt like they were just doing a completely different thing, but giving a character a similar gimmick. There's a lot to love about this movie. Even when it comes to small details, like that little Lois and Clark cameo at the end, that was great. Y you didn't need to do it, but but you did, and I appreciate it. Even snuck little Jimmy Olsen in there. Look at that, it's cute. I dig it. It's good. It's good. If you haven't checked it out already, I would highly recommend getting your hands on a copy of The Doom That Came to Gotham. I think it's at the very least worth the watch just for all the insanity that it managed to cram into its runtime. And I need to tell you, this is only a review of the video. Uh, there's more to it. It's, it's crazier than I made it seem. I am greatly underselling it. And it's not by choice. I'm just not a good salesman. I don't have the words to articulate this absurdity. So check it out for yourself. With all that being said, if you like this video and want to see more Batman content here on the channel, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying I am going to suck your blood. I am Batman. Ah, nuts to you, you rank spud. I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds. And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time, same bad channel.